hi everyone. Um, my name is Sumi, um, or you can call me Dr. Sumi, and I'm basically being asked to talk about sleep with you all. So um, uh, it's a real privilege and a pleasure. And um, I thought what we're going to do is a little sort of almost like a little tutorial on sleep, but I think it's really important to be able to understand um, the reasons, you know, um, why sleep is important and also understand a little bit about sleep physiology. And then that enables us to have better tools to deal with our sleep. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so um, uh, I decided to uh, title this talk Sleep the Most Important Medicine because in my opinion it is the most important medicine. It's free, um, it's the most, um, it, it's absolutely profound actually and I do a lot of research in sleep and I'm, I've been quite amazed at the amount of research data that's out there. So let's go. And just to sort of put myself into context, I'm actually a GP working for the NHS. Um, I'm also a GP with an interest in musculoskeletal medicine. And recently I've qualified in integrative medicine, which is basically um, how we combine lifestyle medicine with conventional medicine, with complementary medicine and traditional whole medical systems. So things like traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, which I'm currently studying. So we really like to have you know, we like to sort of take a holistic um, approach to our patients and we see the whole of that patient. So we really look upstream and try and focus on that so we can improve um, people's lives. And obviously sleep is not a big thing and I focus a lot on that. So here we go. So, um, okay, so a little bit sleep advice with me. <laughs> so just a bit of a fun title there. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today, and um, we're going to talk about the art of sleep, um, why sleep, why now, uh, talking a little bit about sleep physiology, um, the negative impacts of not sleeping, because I know we all focus on sleeping, but what happens to you in terms of if you don't sleep? Of course, you feel tired, but actually you'll be quite alarmed to learn all the different things that can happen to you if you don't sleep. And some tips on a good night's sleep. Okay, I'm a little bit of an art lover, and um, one of my favourite um, artists, um, well, the group of artists are the Pre-Raphaelites, and I think they're just amazing. They kind of really draw on romantic sort of uh, poetry and, and painting. And um, this was a lovely picture I saw in the Tate Gallery by uh, Sir Edward Coley Byrne-Jones, and it's amazing how sleep has really transfixed through the centuries. And this is a beautiful painting where everybody is just fast asleep and really beautiful colour and, and I just thought the detail and it was just lovely because it has a lot of Italian influence and um, Italy is one of my favourite countries. I just think it's uh, just so beautiful to look at and especially since we can't go on holiday, I thought I'd bring some of the holiday into my presentation today. Okay, um, here's another picture of the Pre-Raphaelites, but let's, let's talk a little bit about sleep, the actual term sleep. Um, I think the term is quite, it's very elegant, but it's quite a heavy word because if you can't get enough sleep, if anyone says you must sleep, sleep just sounds really heavy. We really crave it, especially when it doesn't, when we can't get it, when we find it very hard to sleep and, and that's when we really want it more. And it feel, leaves us feeling burdened if we haven't slept, uh, we feel a bit bogged down and entrenched. And it's viewed both as a necessity, but for some people it's an extravagance because you know trying to get some sleep is, is really challenging for so many people. But really sleep is an essential biological process, but it can also be a burden, especially if you're completely um, regulated by, oh, I've got to sleep, I've got to sleep, and, and this plays on, on your mind all the time, and that, that's really challenging. So let us first explore sleep challenges in the 21st century. And I think it's quite apt um, now that we're entering another lockdown that we talk a little bit about the challenges of how um, we feel um, with coronavirus, because I think coronavirus has presented a huge number of challenges, especially for people's mental health. And sleep is one of the big things that is being affected considerably, actually. So a lot of the studies that have been done have been done in America. And um, uh, because, you know, it's obviously a vast country and they have a lot of research power out there. And um, they've actually, the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention is now saying that insufficient sleep is a public health epidemic. So obviously we're in the pandemic, but sleep, not getting enough sleep is, is that scale as well. And um, it's really important that we recognize this. And I think increasingly more and more I'm seeing with my patients, they're not sleeping. And, and, and I think our ill health is increasing as one of the reasons for it. 
So factors, if you think about what factors, why is it that our sleep has been affected so much? And so more recently in sort of the last sort of century, especially the last later half of the century, um, of course, we're doing increasing working hours. There's a lot more productivity, maybe not at the moment with lockdown, but there's a lot of prosperity, consumerism. Um, we don't seem to have that much leisure time. Um, and there's a time squeeze going on. And if you think about um, our working lives have changed. I mean, females initially in the 50s, 60s used to be considered the um you know the housekeeper they used to look after the home and 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 uh, you know and they used to make the nice food and everything and enough things of course changed in the sort of 60s and 70s and women became empowered to be able to go out and work but then subsequently they are also still having to do all that housework too the cooking and the cleaning and 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 um, and also males as well so males are really good at cleaning and cooking as well so this affects all all populations but what i'm saying is that in addition to doing your normal housework you're having to work as well and 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 now you're getting a lot of work you know both parents working in a family and of course, there's a digital revolution and um, there's been a massive growth in digital media and smartphones and a real sort of pressure on people that, you know, they must increase their productivity. But I think this is probably one of the key things I feel that people are struggling with and that there are blurred lines now between the home and the workplace and more so now than ever with people working from home. And I think the thing is, you know, before you'd go to work and you'd finish at five and you'd go home and, and in those days, if there was no internet or, or nothing, then people couldn't get hold of you. You know, the next time you would get the information you needed was when you went into work the next day. But now people can email you and text you and WhatsApp you and send you an Instagram and send you Facebook messages and you're constantly being bombarded, uh, whether you like it or not. And of course, social media, uh, we tend to be increasing our use of screens in the bedroom room and also before bed. Now this is a really lovely graphic. Um, it's produced by the sleepfoundation.org if you want to have a little look more um, at the sort of details of it but it really tells you about how much we should all be sleeping and if you, if you look Oh, what it is to be a newborn, hey? 14 to 17 hours, lush. <laughs> and obviously uh, that is probably, that's recommended but the uh, the sort of numbers in the green are basically what could be appropriate and above that or below that is not um, is not recommended so as you can see as we get uh, as we go through life we need less and less sleep you know i mean the teenager years that's sort of eight to ten um, hours a young adult is seven to nine um, adult, um you know an older adult is seven to nine hours and then an older adult so 65 plus is seven to eight but really that's where you're sort of leveling at around seven to nine hours and and some people, yes, they do sleep 10 to 11 hours. I'm finding that in the winter, certainly I'm wanting to sleep but more. And six hours with some people. Um, uh, there's lots of sort of historical figures who, who said that they got away with very little sleep. I, I, you know, and I know a lot of politicians sort of almost pride themselves on that. But I don't think it's uh, something to be particularly proud of, considering uh, when you're going to find out what it does when you don't sleep. So really important. Sleep in itself, um, the fact that people are not sleeping, um, this is having a massive, massive cost to the UK. Nearly £30 billion pounds are lost um, because, of, um, uh, because of problems with sleep. So 200,000 working days are lost and one in every three, per, every three people in the UK are affected by insomnia. I think that's quite really alarming actually one in three i mean that is just um very very worrying and and you find that people tend to feel tired at two times of the day and um, usually it's two in the afternoon uh, or two in the morning that's sort of the uh, sort of the time when when our energy levels sort of seem to go down and um, working night shifts that's also another challenge and um, people who do work night shifts because they're not quite um alert as their uh, colleagues who do day shifts they tend to have higher risk of injury there's a 30 percent risk of injury if you're working the night shifts and there's almost 3.2 million night workers in the uk which uh, amounts to one in nine people and of course um, there are lots of health risks so people who sleep less than six hours a night have a 13 percent higher mortality risk so that means they're 13 percent more likely to die than people who sleep 
for um, at least seven hours. So that one hour can make a profound difference. And people who sleep less than seven hours are 30% more likely to be obese as well. And I will show you a slide a little bit later on showing why it's important. Um, you know, obesity is a real epidemic pandemic uh, in itself. So really, as I said in the last slide, adults do need between seven to nine hours of sleep. We spend a third of our lives sleeping. So it's really important if you're going to sleep, which we're, which we're going to do, is to have a nice cozy bed and make your bedroom lovely and comfortable and, and nice. So better sleep is the biggest single contributor to living better. So really, you can transform your life by actually sleeping appropriately. Again, as I said, a lot of the studies have been done in the US and I, I find this slide quite disturbing, especially when I could actually <laughs> relate myself to it. Um, but it shows teenagers and parents and um, what kind of um, use, usage of social media. And as you can see, uh, before going to bed, um, you know, within 30 minutes of going to bed, 70% of teenagers are either on their phone or their laptop. And adults are no, not much better. 61%, we should be uh, providing a good example, but obviously not in this case. And, uh, and then I, I was really shocked that people actually looked at their phones during the night, <laughs> even at least once during the night. Uh, you have a 36% of teenagers and 26 uh, you know, percent of parents. And then this is probably where I, I fall, uh, you know, um, sort of guilty because after waking up, they say within five minutes, at least 32 percent of teenagers look at their phone and 23 percent of parents. I'm probably a little bit better. I'm within the 30 minutes. Not that it makes it should be any better. So I've been trying to stop that. But 64 percent of teenagers will be looking at their phones or their social media within 30 minutes of waking and adults, as I said, 62 percent. So. These are quite worrying figures because it just shows how our life is almost ruled by our, well, by our social media, our tablets, our phones. And this is something that we really do need to think about changing for the future. So um, again, um, again, as I said, studies have been done in America. And this is really interesting because I'm sure that you've probably um, relate to doing a lot of these things in lockdown, you know, like watching multiple episodes of a TV show or a streaming service, um, finishing a book, watching sports, playing video games. So this again, um, people are binging. Um, I was uh, driving to work uh, one day and I heard on the radio how this woman said, oh, you know, I, I feel awful. I'm at work and I feel I'm going to be sick. She says, you know, I just couldn't help myself. I stayed up all night and watched this, um, watched this drama that the BBC have been showing. And I ended up just decided to go on the iPlay and watch all six episodes. And, and, you know, now I feel awful. My head hurts. You know, I went to bed at four and I thought, why have you done that? Because, you know, your productivity, you're, you're feeling really unwell. But what it's going to do to you is, is really worrying. And, 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 you know, this is one, this is the thing I think is very challenging, especially during during this time with the COVID pandemic, um, millions of people already had insomnia before, but after the coronavirus, um, this is suggesting that numbers are even going up because people are really feeling anxious. And there's lots of reasons for that. And um, of course, there's the social distancing, so the lack of physical contact, there's a lack of a schedule for many people, and um, being at home, indoors, isolated. Um, you can either have a risk of where you oversleep, so you're not sleeping efficiently. Um, a lot of people are anxious, they're worried, um, they're fearsome, you know, they're fearful. Um, they've got economic concerns you know there's so many job losses happening at the moment and the potential recession and there are also many unknowns about this um, pandemic so you know we like to know as human beings what is our next thing what are we doing we like to plan things and we can't plan anything and i think this is really causing a lot of anxiety with people um, you know, they're saying, will a vaccine be found? You know, and, and so people are really, really worried. And of course, there is now a progressive increasing lack of confidence and in frustration in how higher authorities are handling the crisis. And of course, this uncertainty it disrupts sleep. You know, you get a racing mind, your body's tossing and turning all night because you're really worried. So you can understand why sleep is becoming such an issue. 
Now, uh, why is sleep particularly important during a pandemic? More, you know, also it's just important generally, but why more so in a pandemic? Well, sleep is, as I said, a critical biological process. And um, during the COVID-19, it's even more important for our physical and mental well-being because actually sleeping appropriately empowers an effective immune system. And I think we forget that we do have immune systems that can fight viruses. And if you see that it's almost like a bit of a postcode lottery of who gets the virus really badly needing to be hospitalized. And usually this can be reflective partly to do with their immune systems and how strong the immune systems are. So by sleeping in itself, you are actually helping your immune system, you're helping your immune cells to fight any infection. So really important and really key. Also by sleeping, you enable your brain function to be heightened. So therefore that will enhance your mood and it also improves other mental health conditions sort of, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, eating disorders. So sleep is really amazing. If you just do this sleep thing, you know, all the things, all the benefits that can happen to you. So let's talk a little bit about the physiology of sleep now, because I think if you can understand how we sleep, then you can target how to sleep better better if you know what I mean. Okay, so there's a really good book. Um, it's quite dense and intense, but it's very good. It's, it's by Matthew Walker and it's called Why We Sleep. And um, I actually read, a, read it uh, from cover to cover because I was absolutely fascinated by the amount of research gone into that. And what, um, what Matthew Walker basically says is that really, if you look at us, we're actually, society is divided into what we call early larks and night owls. And early larks are the people, those annoying people, myself included, who wake up really early in the morning, about five or six, and like full of the joys of spring off, they've done their yoga, they've done their walking, they've done everything, and then they go into work and, and work and whatever they need to do. And then they come home, um, they have their tea and stuff, and then they go to bed early. And then you get the night owls. Now, I used to be a night owl, and I, I think really inherently I am an early lark, but I became a night owl because of, I had so much study and stuff. So night owls, what do night owls do? Well, they get up late and they just take their time and, you know, but, and then they go to bed late. So they have pretty much the same number of hours awake, but their days shifted slightly. So they might want to wake up at eight, nine o'clock. And I'm sure you'll have friends and family members who you know, who likes to wake up early and who likes to wake up late. But actually that's an ancestral thing, because if you think about it, we used to live in tribes before and if everybody went to bed at 10 and woke up at six there would be eight hours where the tribe would be unprotected from the predators so by actually having early larks and night owls what you're in effect doing is 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 making a massive difference here so let me just show you here so this is uh, obviously a late, <laughs> a late owl night owl there but um by actually you know, uh, so what would happen is some of the tribe would go to sleep maybe, I don't know, 10 o'clock, and then they'd wake up at six, while the other members of the tribe might go to bed at 12 and wake up at eight, and then another member might uh, go to bed at two and wake up at 10. So in effect, instead of having eight hours where somebody could attack you and there's no one to protect you, you'd reduce that to four hours. So in a way, this is how we were produced. And actually, they're now showing that the early lark and night owl is actually determined by your genetics. It's what we call a chronotype. But unfortunately, the way we live in society, and maybe this will be a positive thing from the coronavirus, is that the society actually favours the early lark. They like to get you in their work early. You know, whose idea was it that we should go to work at seven, eight o'clock in the morning? And, and then you sit there in traffic because everybody's going to work at the same time. And you think, no, no, there has to be a better way of doing this. So the poor night owl has to drag itself out of bed. And it's really branded as lazy because it wakes up late. It stays up late, you know, not favored by works, um, by society's work schedules. And unfortunately, because they have to get up early, but they like to go to bed late, they end up burning their candle at both ends. Unfortunately, the poor night owl is also, because of this very reason, is more at a higher risk of anxiety, depression, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular problems and strokes. So hopefully with the coronavirus and, and the fact that people are working from home and et cetera, et cetera, hopefully people are going to have a lot more flexible working hours. And certainly I've changed my, um, because, you know, I, I used to go to work really early and, and I've asked to go to work a bit later now um, because 
um, I think deep down in my heart, I'm a night owl. I'm trying to be an early lark, but deep down, I'm a night owl. And uh, and I find that if I go to work a bit later, just half an hour, it makes a massive difference to my productivity. So another really interesting thing to think about. So we're going to talk a little bit in the physiology about our circadian rhythms. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, sleep pressure and also um, how our, our sort of rhythms, our sleep rhythms. So talking about the circadian rhythm, this is actually a rhythm, you know, like we have the rhythm of the seasons, the rhythm of the years, and the rhythm of our body clock, and the rhythm of, you know, work. We have our own sleep rhythm, and that's within us, and it's like a biological clock, and it's actually at this, what we call the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that's actually just behind here. It's sort of, uh, sort of, a little bit back into the brain right at the front and what it does is your uh, light that comes through the eyes goes you know the messages go through the um, eyes and then they um, sort of converge on what we call the optic nerve and then that goes to that suprachiasmatic nucleus and um, the circadian rhythm not only just obviously um, regulates our sleep but it regulates our body temperature um, and um, also how wakeful we are and then when we need to sleep and it does that by releasing something known as melatonin now this is a really important hormone you've probably heard of this and you need this hormone to feel sleepy and this is released from the pineal gland which is a little pea-sized gland at the in the brain at dusk so as soon as the light starts to go the the eyes can sample that there's no natural light coming in then they'll think right let's start releasing that melatonin it's time to go to bed soon and it starts to instruct you to go to sleep so this is a really nice picture just showing you the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the light coming in through the eyes, and subsequently whatever um, the suprachiasmatic nucleus samples, that will then become our physiology, that will be our output rhythm for physiology and behaviour. So this is a really interesting thing, which now I think people are beginning to realize more and more that the blue LED light from our tablets and mobile devices, that actually still mimics almost like a daylight. So it stops this melatonin, which will only be produced when the light starts to go down. So it still makes your brain think you're, it's daytime. And because of that, the quality of your sleep is diminished, which is really quite a, a interesting and quite a worrying fact, considering considering we're at our laptops and stuff till quite late. So a little bit more on blue light. Um, blue light is actually found in energy efficient lights and digital devices. It's a short wavelength, so it stimulates the sensors in the eyes to send signals to your brain's internal clock, that suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it tricks your brain into thinking it's daytime. And it's, um, it's, it's obviously really good to have blue light during the day because it boosts your mood, your reaction times and your concentration. Obviously the light that we get from our um, atmosphere from the sun but in the evening um, what if you keep carry on doing that it then starts to suppress the natural production of your melatonin and this is what disrupts your circadian rhythm and this is what makes it harder to fall asleep and stay asleep and it's interesting that we're having a sleep pandemic uh, seems to have sort of almost uh, paralleled our use of social media and, and mobile devices. So that's very interesting. Why are we having such an issue with sleep? Maybe it's to do with what we're using in our everyday lives now. So um, one of the things uh, I'm currently doing a course in America and obviously they have an eight hour time difference. So their morning is our evening and I really don't like to do anything on the laptop after six o'clock but unfortunately my course is from five till eight um you know three um three evenings a week so i'm i'm having to wear these glasses which have a blue light filter so at least and to be fair i've, I've been sleeping reasonably okay not as not as good maybe if i don't look at the computer at all but it's it's helping to some degree and what the blue glass filtered lights do, they basically um, block the exposure of this harmful light to your brain. So it doesn't get that signal that makes you stay awake. And even some smartphones and tablets do have a night shift mode to change the blue light to a warmer, redder wavelength. But um, it's still, you know, it's obviously less powerful at suppressing the melatonin, but it will still suppress that melatonin to a degree. Really, the best thing is to stop using screens a couple of hours, I would say, before bedtime at least, and keep electronics out of the bedroom. My rule is don't use anything after six, you know. And um, uh, not only for that reason that it keeps you awake, but also the fact that blue light 
also stimulates you. So it stimulates you in the sense of it, it gets your brain really alert. And, and, and you don't want to be alert like that before you're going to sleep because you're going to be like, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And, da, da, da. and, then, and then usually that's what happens. You go to bed and you're like, oh, you know, because you just so if you can understand why now you understand that, that that's because the melatonin is affected, your circadian rhythm is therefore affected, that will make you understand better why it's important to um, avoid those devices. Another thing which I think is really interesting is sleep pressure. Now, sleep pressure in the brain, you have a, um, a neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters are chemicals that are basically um, go across synapses. So a synapse is what, what you normally have. You have nerves in your body which send messages and signals, but the nerves don't run all the way along. They, they have to, you know, they have to be of a certain length. And at the point where they stop and join another nerve, there's a gap and that's called a synapse. And the way the nerve transports its message across is it gets to the end, the, the, the impulse or the electric um, signal, and then it stimulates these little receptors to release these little chemicals called neurotransmitters. And they go and attach to the next nerve and they stimulate that and then you get the electric signal. So that's how the electric signal can go from one nerve to another, you know, through the body. It's really clever, our bodies are. So anyway, adenosine is actually what we call an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So like, as I said, when the electric impulse goes and then the, um, it, stimulates the, um, it stimulates the release of this neurotransmitter, usually if a nerve wants something to keep going, it'll be a stimulating effect. So when the, when the actual chemicals, when the neurotransmitters bind the receptors on the other nerve, they will stimulate it to cause that um, thing to happen. But then there are some, uh, re uh, some receptors that if you bind them, it stops that signal from going. And that's what we call an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Okay, so um, adenosine actually because it works as what we call a central nervous system depressant because it stops the signals going. It actually depresses the whole system. Depresses it not in the sense that it makes it sad. It just stops it firing and being so active. Yeah, and it's important because obviously if you're going to go to bed, you don't want all your nerves to be like, oh, look at this and look at that and look at this. You want the nerves to be calming down, and that's how adenosine does its job. It promotes sleep by calming the nerves down and stops you getting so aroused. So when we awake, the levels of adenosine are quite low initially, but as, as we stay awake, they start to increase hour by hour and they build up during the day. And then you get increasing amounts of adenosine by the end of the day. These attach to the receptors in the brain and therefore they stop all the firing and then the brain calms down and it's ready to go to sleep. So it, usually the levels of adenosine peak about 12 to 16 hours after being awake. And when you sleep, that's what makes the adenosine go down again. So it takes about eight hours. So that's interesting, seven to nine hours for our sleep. And then it starts to creep up again. So I've been up quite early today. So my adenosine, I would say, has already got a good seven hours in there. So uh, I'll probably start to feel sleepy in about another seven or eight hours, you know. So really interesting. Now, look at what we do. We love our coffee. Yes, coffee is great. And why does coffee give us that? Yes, when you're trying to get that assignment in or that, you know, that journal or that, you know, whatever you want to do, you want to get that in? What do we reach for? Our coffee. What do we reach for when we're sleep deprived because we've been watching TV all night? Our coffee. Yeah. And how does coffee work? Well, coffee actually blocks these adenosine receptors. So it artificially mutes that sleep signal. So adenosine would normally calm the brain down. What the coffee does is, aha, I'm going to block you from doing it so instead of the adenosine attaching to the receptor and causing a nice calming effect the coffee attaches that receptor instead and causes a stimulating effect so the adenosine can't bind its receptor because the coffee is sitting in it yeah the coffee molecule so you stay awake and what I find really shocking is actually coffee is the most widely used and abused psychoactive stimulant in the world and when you think about the number of coffee shops that we have around us that have suddenly sprouted out from all over, you know, I mean, we have, I, I can't, you can't go, you know, one block, you know, you, there's coffee shops everywhere, you know, I um, in the station, in, in, in our houses and cafes and, 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 you know, think of the boom in coffee, um, in coffee um, sort of corporates, all these kind of places. So really interesting. And look at what do we all have? You'll see people having coffee. People are on their laptops <laughs> drinking coffee, <laughs> two things which are not good for sleep. So really interesting to see that. Now, I think this is amazing just to show you how the caffeine in coffee can be really um, quite detrimental. 
I don't know how they did this experiment, but what they did was they got some spiders and they managed to give the spiders, um, they had a spider that wasn't given anything. One spider was given marijuana, one spider was given uh, benzodrine. Um, uh, um, these are sort of, um, um, sort of drugs that we normally help to sleep. You know, there's chloral hydrate, you know, calming drugs and caffeine. So this is, uh, this is what the, um, the spiders were given. And look at the caffeine web. It's absolutely all over the place. Even the marijuana web is actually really good, you know. So it just shows you how caffeine can be really quite detrimental, that even the spider's web is all over the place. And you just think of how many of us function on coffee. So, so we've talked a little bit about, um, we've talked about the circadian rhythm, we've talked about sleep pressure, and now we're going to talk about the sleep cycle. So understanding our own sleep. So really sleep has two stages. Um, you have the NREM, the non-rapid eye movement, and the REM. Yes, a really good pop group from the 80s and 90s, but here it means rapid eye movement. So every 90 minutes you're swapping between the two. So one uh, 90, 90 minutes it's NREM and then it'll go to REM, okay? And what people wonder, why do we have these different weird styles of sleep? What's going on? Well, they think it's actually when the brain is um, remodeling its nerves and everything. And so all the memories you've had from the day are getting nicely stored away. All the stuff that happened that the brain doesn't want anything to do with, it's cleaning it out. It's almost like a good old declutter that needs to happen in the brain. Also the body, of course, um, you've got in the detoxification, the liver, all of these um, um, organs are working because they've got a chance to rest now the gut's got a chance to rest and digest its food and do what it needs to do so the NREM sleep is what we call a slow wave sleep and it uh, gives you this opportunity for inward reflection um, transferring and distilling memories and it tends to dominate the early sleep so that's why it's important we go to bed early around 10-ish because that is when you're getting the NREM sleep if you go to bed a little bit later, the NREM sleep will only come at a set time. You will lose, you'll miss out on some of the NREM sleep. And, and this is, this is, you know, this is, this is worrying because people don't realize, you think you sleep and you'll get the same quality, but the sleep quality is different at different stages of the night. Yeah. And the, some of the best sleep quality is actually the first two hours up to midnight. That's when really good quality sleep happens. And that's when your NREM sleep happens. And the REM sleep, yes, it's disrupted by alcohol. That's when you get the integration, the interconnection, the innovation and the problem solving. Um, I've many a time woken up at like five with a brainwave, like, yes, I can write that in my essay or yes, that's how I can treat that person and blah, blah, blah. So uh, REM is important for that. And this tends to happen later in sleep and it becomes more dominant. So the NREM sleep is more dominant in your early, um, uh, early sleep and the REM becomes more dominant in the later as the night goes on. You'll see that, but both are critical. So let's talk about the NREM sleep. This, this is known as a slow wave. It has four stages. You've got the stage one, which is that weird stage when you're from wakefulness to sleep, where you're just falling asleep. You know, when you, when you see somebody sitting there watching TV and they're like this, <laughs> that, that's the NREM stage one. It lasts for about five to 10 minutes and it's about 5% of your sleep cycle. Now, if you look at the waves, the brain waves, they manage to monitor the brain waves. What they're seeing is these alpha waves um, um, you have in initially, they start to disappear into what we call theta waves, okay? Um, and I'll show you a picture in a minute which shows you the waves. And then stage two is when your conscious awareness lessens. And this is uh, probably about 40 to 50% um, of your time is in this, in this stage two. And this is when your body temperature drops, your heart rate drops. You start to feel cold when you're tired because, because this, the body wants to go to sleep, you know, so the body temperature is dropping. That's stage two in REM. And the brain started to produce these things known as sleep spindles. And this lasts for approximately 20 minutes. You know, this is when you're really slowly disappearing. And then three and four is the deepest stage of sleep. This is your delta waves then. And that sort of takes about 15 to 20% of the NREM cycle. And that's when your muscles relax, your blood pressure and breathing rate drop. You don't recollect this at all. Okay. But some people have some quite horrific things happen to them during this uh, stage of sleep where there's some people can get night terrors, they go sleepwalking and sleep and they have no recollection whatsoever. That's because they're in their deepest part of sleep. 
Yeah. I remember when I moved into a halls of residence as a student, the first night I remember uh, I, I going to the toilet and um, uh, and I was just walking down the stairs and suddenly I saw my next door neighbour pretty much he was wearing nothing thank goodness other than his shorts and he was walking down and, and I was thinking oh my gosh and I said hi and he just completely ignored me and, and, and he was walking almost like a zombie and then I realised he was sleepwalking and then, and then the next day I, I asked him and he said yeah oh he said oh I'm so sorry he said how embarrassing yeah you know I, and, and especially if I'm not anxious and I've come to a new place you know I start to sleepwalk and 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 it was really you know I felt quite but he knew he was going down the stairs but he, he was properly sleepwalking you know you could do this and he was just completely transfit really strange but that can happen for some people so here you go, you've got your alpha waves, which are uh, quite, this is when you're awake, but you're resting, your eyes are closed, you're not concentrating on anything. Then it changes into beta waves when you're um, receiving um, uh, sensory stimulation or you're just like, yeah, I'm going to go to sleep now. Then you get your theta waves. This is when you start to feel drowsy and then you get your delta waves. So can you see how the delta waves are much more slower and deeper waves? And that's when you're in deep sleep, delta the deep. Now, the REM sleep is a really strange sleep because when they've done studies, they've looked at the brain and the brain is actually awake. It looks it's awake, but you're actually asleep because your eyes are moving rapidly and that's when you're dreaming. And if you, if you, if you, if you sleep, you find that in the morning is when you start to dream a lot and you have these really bizarre dreams. And actually the body is paralyzed at that point. And um, because otherwise, if you were not paralyzed, you would be living your dream. You know, you'd be running away from the bear or you'd be, I don't know, fishing or whatever. But, you know, so you have to be and, and, it's, and your body is, so you're actually literally, you cannot move um, and your brain can then do what it needs to do without knowing that you're not going to damage yourself. You know, the human body is very, very interesting how it, how it has evolved. So actually, for, for your sleep in general, you can actually utilize some music on, on the internet. You can get special music like theta and delta waves so that your brain starts to have that wave when you're about to go to sleep. So about an hour before I go to sleep, I sometimes put it on. Don't put the theta delta waves, which are heavy metal kind of waves, because you want the gentle music, okay? But there are lots of music that actually um, utilizes these waves. And sometimes it can get your brain into a really nice pattern ready for sleep. So that, that's another thing that you can um, do and these may help people with sleep and, and relieve their anxiety so these are just but now you understand when people say oh why don't you use some theta and delta waves you think what earth is theta and delta waves but now you understand that it's part of your sleep process and you understand the sleep physiology so this is a really interesting as i said to you the nrem sleep is much more um, apparent in the first few hours of the night. So this is the one you're going deep. So if you look on the left-hand side, you can see it's stage four, that's the NREM sleep, one, two, three, and four, and then the REM sleep. But then again, you get one, two, three, and four, four hours after sleep. But then can you see, you don't go into three and four anymore that much as the, as the night continues. And the three and four is really important. But if you go to bed late, then you miss out on that deep sleep yeah so this is why it's important that you try and go to bed at the right time so what happens if you deprive yourself of sleep well goodness me um you have various issues obviously you know yourself you, you start to feel quite tired um you know you can't remember things concentration is hard and and your mental health suffers um, um sometimes you can become quite aggressive or people who sleep deprived can become quite aggressive they start to bully you you can get behavioral problems um, addiction rates you know lots of relapse can happen you can get depression anxiety and even for some people you can even have suicide if you're sleep deprived and you can understand now after i've spoken about sleep why this this is can happen and of course we you know we think about these sort of short-term things but what about um, obviously suicide is not a short-term thing it's a it's a has a horrible consequence and, and depression and anxiety as well but alzheimer's disease uh, is also a, a very um, paramount and it's interesting when you look at as i was saying some politicians would boast about how they sleep very little but a lot of them got alzheimer's disease in later age and that's because they're sleep deprived so the NREM sleep, which is the deep sleep that we were talking about, the one with the four stages, it actually deteriorates with age. So it's even more important that you go to bed at a good time. And, and, and 
we used to, but now with all the phones and everything, people are doing that less. So it's official, and I think this is a really scary statistic. 58% of children are not getting enough sleep. I mean, that is just, that's unforgivable, really, because when you think, uh, you know, as a child, I remember being told we have to go to bed and da, da, da. But by not giving children enough sleep, and you saw from that uh, original graph, children need a lot of sleep. Um, this is all the kind of different things they can have. They can have problems with the concentration, uh, impulse control, risk of anxiety, aggression issues, risk of depression, 97% risk of depression in a child. And, and that is, you know, as a, as a duty of care, we really owe it to our children to make sure they're sleeping and that they're getting the right, and the right amount of sleep. Obviously, as I said, sleep deprivation can affect your immune function. And they've actually shown this in studies so that people who sleep less than six hours, their chance of catching the common cold increases by four times compared to those who sleep more than seven hours. I mean, that is a phenomenal factor. And I, I didn't even realize that. And I was like, wow. And this is why, you know, when we're talking about coronavirus, we should be talking about lifestyle things as well. You know, it's not just about getting a vaccine. We can do a lot of things in the meantime, eat well, sleep well, all of this kind of stuff. And especially if the research is suggesting that sleep affects your immunity, that, that is quite a remarkable um, thing in itself. Um, if you're sleep deprived, it promotes inflammation. Inflammation is actually the root of most, pretty much all disease. Um, it releases what we call cytokines, which are these inflammatory mediators, and it can cause problems with obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, cholesterol deposits, and even cancer. So this is the importance of sleep. So this is the one I was telling you about, the sleep protects against the common cold. So more than seven hours, your chance of getting a cold is about 17.2%. 17 but without, if you sleep less than five hours, your risk of catching a virus, and it could be the coronavirus even, is 45.2%. This is one of the graphs that should have been there at <laughs> the various um, you know, things that we've had, because I think this is a really profound slide in itself and, and it would really help the nation to realize the importance of sleeping. Really important. Of course, um, uh, sleep deprivation, as I said, causes diabetes and, ob and obesity. It affects the glucose, how it's metabolized. Glucose is obviously what causes diabetes when it's not properly metabolized into glycogen, which is a storage. Um, you get more hungry if you don't sleep that well. So people snacking late into the night, watching their box sets or whatever they're doing, um, because obviously they're not sleeping. So the hunger hormone is being released. The cortisol, which is the stress hormone, is also being released. And um, it's released by the stomach. So it stimulates your appetite, makes you eat more, and it promotes fat storage. And therefore, you start to become obese. And you've also got to remember that just because somebody might look slim, that they're not in that, that that they're slim and there's no work. That a slim person can be obese inside. And this is a really interesting picture. Um, uh, toffee means thin on the outside, fat on the inside. That's what toffee stands for. And this is a CT scan where they looked at two people who had the same um, body mass index. But when they did a CT scan, they found that the person on the left hand side, even though they had the same shape and size, had nearly six liters of internal fat compared to the person on the right who had about 1.65. From the outside, they look exactly the same. Yeah, so I think this is again really important to realize. This is a, an obesity infographic, which just shows the risk. I mean, we all know the risks, but just to remind ourselves of asthma, gout, gallstones, infertility, heart failure, dementia, depression, all the cancers, you know, breast, colon, endometrial, ovarian, rectal, prostate, all the cancers. So this is really scary. This is a really scary slide. And if you think of our population, we are progressively becoming more and more obese. And that's not, you know, that's obviously sleep is contributing to that in a big way. Also sleep deprivation and heart health, you know, with um, not sleeping enough, this affects your circadian rhythm, what you were talking about. You start to not be able to think or concentrate. You have a higher risk of blood pressure, a higher risk of heart disease, a higher risk of stroke. 
And of course, there's society effects. We forget about the uh, societal effects, but um, uh, there's, there's research has shown there's increased car crashes in teenagers, truancy rates, psychological effects, behavioral problems. And what happens is the students are not achieving the academic grades that they want and their life expectancy is reducing. And that's really scary because I think we're the first generation where um, the ch we might, you know, that we that the people might outlive, you know, the current generation might outlive the, their children, which I think is really scary, you know, and productivity and reduced performance. So these are all big factors. And, and of course, if nothing else, if, if people are motivated by money, look at how much money is being lost by, you know, not sleeping. Look at the car workplace accidents, comorbid disease, motor vehicle accidents. So hopefully now you've got the idea that sleep physi physiology, physiological necessity, it really is, um, and deprivations in sleep causes serious health effects. And one of the other things that sleep deprivation does, it causes oxidative stress to our mitochondria. So our mitochondria are like our batteries, our energy batteries. There are sort of um, cell packs in our, in our body and um, they can be affected. So if you start to um, have sleep deprivation, the mitochondria start to die and then that can cause a lot of tiredness and fatigue and, and stuff like that so as an integrative doctor i like to look at things that you can do to try and help yourself and certainly to try and protect the mitochondria um, one of the things is to really look at your nutrition um, nutrition is key I, I really do believe what you eat you know you are what you eat basically and um a real sort of um, supportive measure of omega-3 fatty acids. So these are found in oily fish, um, usually mackerel, um, sardines. And obviously, if you are vegetarian, then taking omega-3 fatty acid supplements is really important. Also, things like antioxidants, these stop the um, uh, damage to cells. So things like vitamin C and zinc and taking vitamin C every day because vitamin C is not stored in the body. It's just what you give it that day is used by the body. And of course, other members of the vitamin B family, B12, folic acid, magnesium is really good as well. That's actually very helpful for sleep. People sometimes use a magnesium spray on their feet, um, can be really um, helpful. And uh, usually the source of all of these are like green leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds. OK, so that's where you get all of those goodies from. Also, we talked about melatonin. Remember the circadian rhythm? We talked about melatonin and how um, you know the blue light affects the melatonin but there's actually certain foods that are rich in melatonin that can actually um, stimulate your sleep and that tends to be milk and cherry juice um, not together of course um, it's funny how we all in the olden days I know people used to have an oval teen or a horlicks or something and that was like a nice milky drink you probably remember your grandma having that and and it's interesting because that stimulates the melatonin in the milk you know uh, cherry juice is particularly good and if you think about it, the cherries are around at that time of year when we have really long days um, and and you want to get to sleep and so if you have I always have some cherries on in the summer evenings because it then it makes me feel sleepy because it contains melatonin and this helps across the, all the ages and so these dietary sources may improve your sleep quality and it's tart cherry juice they they've done lots of studies where they found that tart cherry juice concentrate for seven days and it contains something known as anthocyanin um, and this actually um, when they measured the patients when they measured sort of the um, people who um, partook in this when they measured their urine um, uh, melatonin they actually found that they got a quite a high level of melatonin in their urine which then suggested that yes this was giving them melatonin and people said they slept so much better and it was a much more deeper sleep and much better quality of sleep so really interesting of course avoiding and reducing stimulants so now we know all about caffeine and the sleep pressure and the adenosine you can now understand why people say not to have caffeine really after 4 p.m because the adenosine it will block that and the adenosine will just be floating around and it's only when the caffeine releases the receptors then you get all the adenosine flooding the receptor is when you suddenly have this crash where you just have to go to bed you know that's why because because all the caffeine releases the receptors at the same time so there's lots of niceties that are not full of caffeine 
caffeine so chamomile teas tulsi is like um, a holy basil tea that you can get really nice tea that really helps you to um, feel cozy and calm and lemon balm as well and avoiding alcohol which obviously we're not doing at the moment with a lot of people but within three hours of sleep some decongestants actually um, things to try and decongest you actually contain things that stop you from sleeping um, they contain things like pseudoephrodine and regular exercise also helps you sleep but don't uh, do any exercise or stimulating kind of exercise before you go to bed because otherwise you're just going to be buzzing so much better to get the exercise done earlier on in the day um, other complementary treatments well these are sort of aimed more at this you know insomnia can be either you fall you have difficulty falling asleep or you can fall asleep but you can't stay asleep all night so um, these are the main areas where people struggle with and um I've recently uh, qualified as a medical homeopath and uh, some of the remedies that we use for people to help um, with that is in homeopathy, we talk about like treating like and, and, and it's to do with quantum physics and basically by giving a stimulus or something that's similar, what happens is um, the body can then um, uh, re sort of go against that, re-establish its balance. It's almost stimulating the body's own homeostasis to do something right, um, you know, correct about it. So actually from Funnily enough, coffee cruda is a homeopathic remedy used for if you can't sleep and because the uh, remedy itself doesn't contain any coffee, but it contains the energy of the coffee. So the body can then react and, 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 and make you feel sleepy. So it's really good if you're finding that your mind is really active and you can't switch it off. Um, having a remedy like coffee cruda is really good. And the Helios Pharmacy is a really good online uh, pharmacy for getting some of these um, uh, remedies. And they even do a nice sleep remedy, which you can try try as well. Sometimes people can't sleep because they're in pain. So chamomilla is a really good homeopathic remedy. Um, if you're overstudying, like I have been doing recently, gelsimium is a good one. Uh, gelsimium is from the yellow jasmine uh, flower. It's a really good homeopathic remedy, especially if you're ang anxious and you've got a lot of anticipatory anxiety. And of course, some people in this awful time will be losing loved ones and, and will be absolutely struck by grief. And Ignatia is a really good homeopathic remedy for grief, um, really helps for um, usually you take them the, the dosing is not so important because it's more as soon as you start to feel better you stop because then the body that means that the body is then doing what it needs to do but um, as I said if you look on the Helios website there's some lovely remedies and a sleep thing that they do as well and Bach flower remedies are really good um, uh, uh, you know there, there's the calms as well so these are all these things that you can buy um, from the complementary um, shops the food shops and things and um, the Bach flower remedies are flower essences um, again there's lots of different ones and there's a rescue remedy when you're feeling a bit overwhelmed so sometimes actually calming your own anxiety down can help you sleep better a little bit just on exercise now, mind, body, yoga is really good. I'm a yoga teacher and I love it. And I find that doing yoga really reduces, it depends on the type of yoga. There's lots of different styles of yoga, but generally yoga calms you. It stops the fight and flight. It increases your rest and digest. It reduces, um, you know, nervous system. So we call them the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So sympathetic uh, nervous system is when you are in a state of, um, you know, looking after yourself, you're in a state of survival, you're fighting and flight but when you're resting with your mates or having a nice dinner then you're parasympathetic you feel very relaxed and calm and that's your rest and digest so um, yoga reduces your mental and physical stress it lowers anxiety it creates calm and it gives you more vitality energy and happiness Mindfulness, this is a form of meditation. There's no religious or spiritual connotation to it, but what it does, it allows you to stay very much in the present moment and you focus on your breath. And in, in science, we do we use trials known as meta-analyses of, and RCT stands for randomized control trials. So these are trials that are really done with strict scientific rigor. And a meta-analysis is a collection of all these different trials that are done with strict um, scientific rigor. And um, they did a big meta-analysis and they found 330 um, participants with from six randomized control trials and they found that mindfulness really gave a lot of improvement um, in their well-being um, how they were functioning when they were awake and also on their sleep quality so very profound 
Tai Chi, um, as I said, because integrative medicine covers lots of different uh, things. So these are just some ideas. It's a sort of internal Chinese martial art. Um, initially, it was practice for defense training, uh, health benefits and meditation. And again, it's, it's, a, it's where you're standing and you're, you're moving around. And it's to do with the energy, the flow of energy. And research has shown that people who do Tai Chi have significantly improved sleep quality. I, I remember when I was traveling in China many years ago, you'd see people, uh, all the elderly people out on the parks doing tai chi in the morning and tai chi in the evening and it was a lovely sight to see everybody doing the tai chi so again really beneficial for your well-being now the nsf stands for the national sleep foundation they actually suggest as i said um, seven to nine hours of sleep and really uh, a lot of people ask me about naps what about naps you know can i just have a nap if i'm not sleeping really ideally you should really not have naps if you can you know, if, if you can help it, because the quality of the nap will never be as good as the quality of the sleep. And functional medicine is one of the uh, one of the approaches we do in integrative medicine, which is a very scientific way of looking at um, various things, various functions of our body. And they've uh, published some really uh, sort of helpful guidance about saying that, uh, you know, sometimes if obviously if you are sleep deprived, the length of nap can actually determine your potential health benefits. So 10 to 20 minutes will reduce your sleepiness and improve your um, cognition, your awareness. 20 to 30 minutes enhances creativity and sharpens your memory. 30 to 60 minutes sharpens your decision making skills. And 60 to 90 minutes, well, you might as well go to bed then. <laughs> that helps with your REM sleep problem solving. But ideally, really restricting naps to early afternoon is best, which is interesting when you look at the Mediterranean countries, that's what they tend to do. They all go to work at early uh, before the sun gets too hot. And then in the, in the sun, they, you know, then they have their little nap. Uh, but of course, as I said, it's not a substitute for inadequate sleep. You really do need to have a night's sleep if you can. Um, we also look at things such as green care. Um, um, we like to look at all approaches. So green care is nature. And you can see a lot of people are enjoying nature now, the great outdoors. And also don't forget the great indoors, as you can see with my plants. <laughs> so um, trying to create that really helpful sleep environment. So a nice space. Don't, don't ever do studying or anything in your bed, bedroom or watch TV. Make it a place of sleep. It's your you know, it's your man or girl cave, you know, that's where you're going and you have nice plants and, you know, it's just your place of sleep. So every time, every time I enter my bedroom, my brain immediately thinks it's sleep. It just knows it's going to sleep because it's entered that space, you know. Also, arts are really helpful. So especially at this time, writing down your problems, a gratitude journal is really uh, helpful just to be really grateful for what we have got, you know, because we've got a lot, you know. I know it's not very nice having our freedom taken away from us, but you know what? We've, we've got roofs over our head, um, we've got food, and, and, you know, you have to be really grateful for these things. And when you start to have gratitude, you, that actually makes you feel better there's even like a lot of people love poetry and this is a really good uh, book called the poetry pharmacy which i think is a great title for a book uh, by williams Slegheart. so you can check that out if you like poetry and relaxing music hey use your spotify <laughs> use your music and just have that sort of lovely essence you know there are other music stations available but just use some new, nice music and I'm studying at the moment the traditional um, Indian system of medicine, which is actually about 10,000 years old. And, and actually most all of medicine has stemmed from that traditional Chinese medicine, homeopathy. All of that has stemmed from this surgery. Everything has come from Ayurveda and it's really interesting. But one of the things that I've been using and I find it very helpful is to do a warm self oil massage. So getting some oil, um, putting it in a glass container, but then putting it into a cup of hot water, let that oil warm up. You can put some nice essential oils and then give yourself a nice massage before going to bed and more so if you're living by yourself you know um, the, the the value of touch cannot be underestimated a lot of research is now suggesting that touch is so important and obviously with a lot of people living by themselves they're not getting that touch that hugging of their family or anything like that and that in itself is being quite detrimental so by touching yourself giving yourself a nice massage um, has been really shown to be very beneficial so in summary, my sort of top tips for sleep hygiene are a bedtime routine. You wind down, you avoid tech 
technology two hours before you go to sleep, avoid caffeine, um, you know, after four o'clock, do exercise, yoga, tai chi, have a nice um, place to sleep, you keep your room nice and dark and quiet. Um, and also another thing I forgot to mention is if say in the middle of the night, you, you go to the, you know, go to the toilet, don't switch the light on, because if you switch the light on, then that will affect your melatonin. So try, obviously don't fall over and break something, but try and make sure that, you know, you, you have the minimal amount of light on because otherwise it will break your sleep. Um, so it's okay to get up because if you go and go to the toilet and then go back to bed, you usually will fall asleep quite happily. But obviously if you put all the lights on, then it's going to be another thing. Doing maybe a meditation before you go to sleep, cutting down your alcohol, keeping a sleep diary and napping. Um, naps are only if you're sleep deprived, but to limit them. So that's the end. So thank you.